get in just a second. Welcome to the Hinckley Institute of Politics, a nonpartisan institute at the University of Utah. The Hinckley provides an array of transformative experiences for students through internships, forums, and classes. Our forums seek to foster public discourse and civil debate on the most current and pressing issues bringing in local, national, and international thought leaders. To learn more about our office, you can just visit us outside or visit our website at www.hinckley.utah.edu. Um, today, we would like to thank the Non-Proliferation Policy Education Center for making today's event possible, and largely thank you for joining us uh, for today's forum, The Future of Nuclear Power in Utah. Henry Sikalski will actually be introducing our speaker, and a big thank you to him for making all of this happen. Thank you, Molly, um, and thank Hinkley, uh, where there is food for thought. Now, the reason Mr. Bradford is here today is I teach a course at NIAJ, which is the Masters in International Relations and Global Engagement, on the fundamentals of nuclear policy, both civil and military. And I was eager to get someone with practical experience, who I knew, with regard to nuclear regulation and also the economics of different kinds of energy. And I couldn't think of someone better than Mr. Bradford. We have here someone who served on the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, licensed roughly, oversaw licensing of 20 or so reactors. But more important, he actually chaired both a small and a really important large state utility commission in the case of New York and Maine. I've known, uh, I guess, Peter, yeah. Now, uh, we just remembered that we've known one another for approximately uh, 30 years, 28, 30 years. And my first engagement with him had to do with a large nuclear power program in New York, which, for economic reasons, had to be terminated. So. I couldn't think of someone better equipped to talk about the future of nuclear power in Utah than someone who knows the past of nuclear power in the United States. With that, Peter. I think I'm not supposed to use this, but <laughs> have I got this right? I'm just, I'm mic'd up here. Okay. Um, Thank you very much, Henry. I uh, do want to spend a little time discussing the relevance of the history of nuclear construction and the risks that it shows <coughs> for uh, Utah, um, even though this is a new design being built uh, by folks who were not involved in uh, in the past history of nuclear construction. Um, but first, let's make sure we're all on more or less the same page with regard to the project that we're talking about, the uh, um, so-called carbon-free power project or small modular reactor project that a number of Utah municipal utilities are interested in participating in through the vehicle of the uh, Utah Association of Ut Municipal Power Systems. Um, specifically, uh, they're considering purchasing 150 megawatts of nuclear power um, uh, through this uh, umbrella group, we call it UAMPS, for, uh, to make use of the acronym. Um, the small rock modular reactor design would be a first of a kind, that is, typical <coughs> nuclear power plants that have been considered for construction in the U.S. and elsewhere in the world in the last 20 or 30 years have generally been 1,000 to 15 or 1,600 megawatts. Um, the reactors being 
considered for construction at the Idaho uh, National Laboratory um, are 60 megawatts, so much smaller. They would be uh, grouped together in a collection of 12 um, of a 720 megawatt project altogether, but that's with 12 reactors, whereas one conventional reactor would be larger than that. There's something of an irony to this, which is that uh, throughout the history of nuclear power, from the time the first power reactors came online in the U.S. in the late 50s until as recently as 2010, the nuclear industry's insistence has always been that the reactors had to get bigger, um, that the, they were so expensive to build that they needed to produce the maximum number of kilowatt hours to spread the costs over. And while they were having trouble making the economics of the 1,000 megawatt reactor work, the answer was to go to 1,200 or 1,400 or 1,600. And so they were always pushing on the safety regulators to let them build bigger and bigger designs. But in recent years, uh, even the biggest of those designs has proven to be uneconomic, often on a dramatic scale. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. And so we're seeing now the emergence of a 180 degree turnabout in which the industry now says, actually, we had it wrong uh, all those years. The way to make nuclear power cheaper is to build the plants smaller, build them in mo through modular construction at the factory site, ship them to the place where they're going to be used, but relatively little on-site construction. And that way, they say, they'll be able to cut the costs. Now, some of the economic characteristics of this project, perhaps the, uh, the most significant from a, a customer standpoint, is that in concept, at least, the price is capped at 6.5 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, as we'll see, that's a, a bit on the high side compared to power markets. But uh, as a cap, um, it offers some reassurance as to how much risk the uh, participating utilities seem to be taking. Um, there are opportunities for the participant utilities to opt out at various stages, first during the preliminary planning, then during the licensing process, and once more at the uh, commencement of construction. Um, UAMPS is committed to performing what are called economic competitiveness tests, which, uh, if done right, would show the price of this power in comparison to the price of alternative ways of getting the same power, um, including the same low carbon power. Uh, but as we'll see also in a few minutes, there's some question, reason to question whether as currently structured, the proposal really is going to get at the uh, realities of that situation. Um, and uh, the, um, the power is said to be needed by these small municipal utilities in part to replace retiring coal plants, also to meet the projected fairly rapid load growth in Utah and to diversify Utah's power supply, which doesn't presently include any nuclear uh, power generation. Okay, um, now, from my own background uh, in licensing nuclear power plants and regulating the price of electricity, I can tell you that again and again and again, I've seen nuclear projects start out with versions of these same bright hopes, uh, only to end in very expensive disappointments of several sorts. And I'll spend the rest of my talk today outlining what those disappointments have been 
how one might go about uh, recognizing them and also how one might go about uh, guarding against them. The, in the context of the UAPS proposal, the risks take uh, at least three forms. Um, one is that uh, the cap will turn out not to be firm after all, and that Utah customers will be exposed to the full run of potential nuclear cost overruns, which is very large indeed. The second, a little more subtle, is that the cap, even if it's firm, is too high. And that risk exists because it hasn't really been tested against the cost of alternative ways of procuring the same amount of power. Uh, and that's a, a very important step in any power procurement uh, process. Um, and uh, the final concern is that the economic competitive te competitiveness test, as it's presently structured, is not really designed to test the, uh, the project in an effective uh, way against all of the possible alternatives. Um, so let's talk a little about the extent of uh, nuclear power's excess cost uh, problem. Um, for the uh, cost estimates, um, for builders of large nuclear reactors today, uh, not just in the US, but in Western Europe as well, are up in the 12 to 20 cent per kilowatt hour range. Um, the Vodal plant in Georgia, which is the only two plants currently being built in the US, may come in uh, even higher than that. Um, and uh, so the level of cost that is built into nuclear power at present is far, far <coughs> above uh, anything that um, is uh, characteristic of what you're paying for electricity in Utah now. It's far above anything anyone is paying anywhere else in the US for electricity. And it explains why nuclear power has been unsuccessful in the competitive power procurement processes in many parts of the country. Um, the chart that I'm showing now shows you a couple of things. The blue dots are the cost of all the plants built in the US uh, prior to the year 2000. And as you can see, in the early years of nuclear construction, uh, the costs tended to stay down in the five cent a kilowatt hour range, always with a few outlier plants above that. But in the later years, starting around 1980, the costs generally increased uh, pretty dramatically for a, a combination of reasons. The accident at Three Mile Island certainly uh, caused increases in cost, but there were a number of other factors as well. And so by the end of the last century, nuclear plants were being more regularly completed in the uh, 10 or even 15 cent a kilowatt hour range. Now the pink dots, which start in this century, <coughs> tell a different story. They are the stories of the cost estimates in the effort that was for some time known as the nuclear renaissance. And an interesting thing about the low numbers, the pink, the furthest uh, on your left of the pink dots, um, is uh, that they approximate six cents a kilowatt hour. They approximate the same level of cost that is the cap being promised for the UAMPS project. But here's the interesting thing about those cost estimates. They were provided by the vendors, by the people who wanted to build 
the nuclear power plants. Um, and by some academic studies funded by those same vendors. So the potential customers were being told six cents is about the right price. But then a few years went by, uh, some legislative support was secured, enthusiasm was stirred up, but eventually the builders had to start disclosing what the plants were really going to cost because they had to get the permission of utility regulators in order to start putting the costs in rates. And you see what happened as soon as that process began to kick in. The cost estimates just went up and up and up. And there's nothing by the end of that time period anywhere near six cents a kilowatt hour. And in fact, the most expensive of them are up uh, above 20 uh, cents a kilowatt hour. And in fact, that's consistent with the only one of those plants actually uh, being built, namely the, uh, the Vodal plant in, uh, in Georgia. But a number of others were canceled after a lot of money was spent on them. And that brings me to saying just a few words about the role of public power in this <coughs> nuclear construction story, because the UAMPs, municipalities, of course, are all public power systems. They don't have uh, stockholders to cushion uh, any financial shocks. If, if, if things go wrong, they're either going to be protected by that contract or the customers are going to be asked uh, to pay for them. Um, so uh, among the most recent municipal disappointments with nuclear construction, you have Jacksonville, which bought into the Vodal project in Georgia. Uh, and is looking at 100% cost overrun in what they expected to pay. They did not have a ceiling. Um, and even sadder, in South Carolina, Sandy Cooper, which is South Carolina's equivalent to UAMPS, entered into a nuclear construction project called the Virgil Summer uh, Project. The builder of that project, Westinghouse, went bankrupt. Uh, and eventually, after a series of cost overruns were announced. The two utilities building the project decided it just was not economically feasible and they canceled it. But by the time they canceled it, they'd spent $5 billion on it. $5 billion, a state I suppose not so different in uh, size and characteristics from Utah. And they're having uh, extraordinary economic and political impacts uh, spilling out of that. Now, one other item worth noting about these two state experiences, Georgia, South Carolina, both of those plants were of a design called the Westinghouse AP1000. The Westinghouse AP1000 was said to be a design that was going to save a lot of money, going to be a lot cheaper than those blue dots that we saw on that. Uh, chart I showed a couple of minutes ago. And the reason they were going to save so much money was that they were going to rely on modular construction, just like the M in SMR, small modular reactor. Um, and that was going to enable a great deal of savings because the parts would be prefabricated at factories, shipped to the plant sites, and bolted into the plants with no further work needing to be done at the site. That would make standardization much easier, training much easier, um, and licensing review easier. Well, unfortunately, as it turned out, none of those hopes were realized. A substantial part of the cost overruns in both Georgia and South Carolina came from the fact that the modular production facility uh, run by the Shaw Construction Group in Louisiana, and later by Chicago Bridge and Iron, wasn't somehow able to get its hands around modular construction effectively, and couldn't deliver the modules on time, and had a number of misfortunes, including in one case dropping uh, and, and ruining uh, uh, an expensive module. So the contribution, in the end, the, the technique that was hope to bring about the big cost improvements 
wound up contributing instead to really epic cost overruns. Well, I'll move quickly over the other projects here. I intend to spend quite that long on that one. But the Washington Public Power Supply System was a consortium of small municipal utilities in the state of Washington, which undertook to build uh, five nuclear plants at once um, in conjunction with the Bonneville Power Authority, uh, i.e. the Department of Energy. Uh, and after a series of large cost overruns, the little municipals decided they just couldn't carry the project any longer. They also felt that they had been misled at various stages by uh, both the, builder, the corporate builders and the Department of Energy. So they stopped making payments on the bonds, which led to the largest, what was then the largest municipal bond default in U.S. history. Uh, at the Seabrook nuclear plant in New Hampshire, uh, the Massachusetts Municipal Wholesale Electric Company, again a counterpart to UAMPS, uh, bought into Seabrook and then increased its share of Seabrook just as the costs took off. Seabrook was one of the most expensive of the earlier generation of plants. And MWEC too had its bonds substantially downrated. Um, Cajun and Wabash were two good-sized electric cooperatives that bought into nuclear projects, one in the, well, both in the 1980s, but one went bankrupt in the 80s, one went bankrupt in the 90s. So municipal ownership, corp, uh, cooperative ownership, uh, has not been any, uh, any kind of a buffer against um, both ratepayer impact and substantial misfortune and cost overruns. Um, a few other notes from this earlier history to keep in mind in sizing up uh, assurances that everything's under control and, and is certain to go smoothly with uh, present-day projects. A surprising uh, fact about nuclear construction, I don't think it's true of any other industry in history, is that more than half of all the plants announced be built in the United States since the 1950s were canceled. And that total includes many that had gotten their NRC licenses, quite a few that had had hundreds of millions spent on them, and a few that had had billions. Um, uh, it also includes 29 of the 31 plants that had license applications pending at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission just 10 years ago. That was the peak of what was then thought to be the nuclear renaissance. Um, but in the years since then, as gas prices have fallen and nuclear cost estimates have risen, demand has fallen, energy efficiency and renewables have gotten ever less expensive. One plant after another has been canceled. A number of them were canceled at relative of the cost. They were just paper designs. Um, but a few, like the one I mentioned in South Carolina and another one in Florida, more than a billion was spent before the cancellation. Um, and uh, one note that I want to make here and then come back to later is that a side effect of these very substantial commitments to building nuclear plants is that it freezes the, the small utilities power supply planning process for substantial periods of time especially as the cost overruns kick in, because they're committed to a fairly good-sized block of power from one place. Why would they be looking around at alternatives to it? And the full attention of their management more and more is focused on trying to get control of these runaway costs. Um, now let's shift gears into the second of the concerns that uh, I mentioned, namely that the 6 point five cents a kilowatt hour, which is also $65 a megawatt hour, may not be as good a cap as the proponents of this project would like to think. What this slide is showing you is uh, nine years, 10 years worth of history in the uh, Texas power market, which is a market of a type that doesn't exist in 
Utah. It does exist in more than half of the U.S., and it enables all types of electric power generation to compete against each other and also to compete against projects that include load management and energy efficiency so that instead of just taking the projections uh, of a would-be power plant builder, um, one has an ongoing set of prices to look at in terms of commitments that generators are really prepared to make and stand behind in order to sell electricity. Um, and as you can see, uh, what this graph is telling you is that uh, the average price for every year in the last 10 is under uh, six and a half cents a kilowatt hour, indeed under six cents a kilowatt hour. But more significantly, the average price for the whole period uh, is 3.4 cents a kilowatt hour, um, or barely half of the proposed cap price in the uh, UAMPS project. So when measured against what power markets in a region not so far from here are providing, the UAMPS price cap even if, and we'll talk a little more about this too, even if the company uh, UAMPS is prepared, is able to stick with it, is not so great a deal. You're committing to buy power for a very long period of time at a price well above the, uh, the existing market price. Um, this next chart is just another illustration of the same point, only it comes at it from the standpoint of all of the power markets in the U.S., not just the state of Texas. Um, and it's only the last two years. It's not the last 10. Uh, but again, what it's showing you is that in the last two years, in every single market in the U.S., even the ones that are much more expensive than Texas, kilowatt hours never reach the price of 6.5 cents. Uh, and. Uh, so there's really no place in the country where six, a, a long-term 6.5 cent commitment would look like a good deal today. Um, this next graph is a first cousin to those points. Um, what it illustrates is the recent trends in the price of different types of generation. I apologize. It's probably not so easy to read from where uh, you all are sitting. But in essence, that sharply downsloping yellow line is the price of large solar. Uh, the only price that's moving upward is the red line, the nuclear power line. Um, the blue wind line, uh, the other solar line, um, and the gas line are all moving downward, and they're all below the cost of nuclear energy. The important question that raises for our purposes with regard to the economic competitiveness test that I was talking about earlier is why in the world isn't that test, is that test only considering gas? Um, why isn't it considering <coughs> combinations of these alternatives. Because when nuclear plants have closed, when nuclear power has been displaced, it's almost never been by just one source. It's always displaced by combinations of resources, some in power plants that run more, some in new power plants that get built, some in energy efficiency. Energy efficiency is not even on this chart, but if it were, it would be also well below the nuclear line. Um, Combinations of renewables with storage would be below the nuclear line. Uh, grid management, uh, which is becoming an increasingly important area in power supply planning, would also be below the nuclear line. And the combination of all of them together represents some really large innovative opportunities 
of the sort, just to look at another utility for a moment, of the sort that we've seen in the telecommunications industry, um, in which 30 years ago uh, was essentially a uh, set of monopoly propositions based on, well, let's go back 40 years, the old rotary dial phone, and now you've got more intelligence in the smartphone in your pocket than there ever was in the Bell System uh, central offices. That is happening in the electric industry too, more slowly because you can't get away from the wires in electricity the way you can in telecommunications. But the control is migrating out toward the customers uh, more and more as people get control of their appliances, companies get control of their power use. Um, and all of that is antithetical to long-term commitments to large central station sources like nuclear, especially when the price is uh, above the market price anyway. Um, well, I've t now uh, kind of anticipated aspects of this slide uh, in that we've seen that uh, the um, economic competitiveness test focusing only on nuclear power uh, needs, to be, needs to be broadened and perhaps done more often. Um, but there's a second question uh, about the contract and, and the cap too. And that is really how firm is the cap? What happens when the project starts to experience cost overruns, which as we've seen from the nuclear history to date, are almost inevitable because all you have now are the vendor estimates. And that's never the end of the story. It's always the starting point for an upward sloping line. Well, at some point, as the UAMPS customers sit protected behind their 6.5 cent cost cap, other entities are feeling a lot of pain. Uh, New Scale is an owner. Um, if the price doubles or triples as it has in some cases, can they stand behind that or might they go bankrupt as Westinghouse did? Uh, is the Department of Energy committed to picking up the difference between the new scale, uh, uh, the difference between the UAMPS uh, capped price and whatever the actual cost becomes? Because if the answers to these questions are no, then we know how this story will play out. We saw it in Georgia, we saw it in South Carolina, we've seen it in a lot of other places. One day, the big boys, the builder of the reactor, the Department of Energy, come and knock on UAMPS's door and they say, we're really sorry, we thought we could commit to 6.5 cents a kilowatt hour. It turns out we're just not gonna be able to do that. You guys have it in your contracts, but if we don't renegotiate the contract, the project's going to have to be canceled, or the project's going to have to be shut down, or da 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 da. And at that point, the UAMPS members being millions and millions of dollars in the hole, the directors having committed a good deal of prestige to the project, and the argument being it's not going to cost that much more to complete it. It's not. Maybe we wouldn't have gone down this road if we'd foreseen this, but now that we're here and it's only going to cost another billion dollars to finish, it's better to do that than to do anything else. You shouldn't pay attention to the sunk costs. That's what happened in South Carolina and Georgia. Georgia most recently has gone through that process for the fourth or fifth time. And the small municipals wind up agreeing to increase the charges to their customers because even though they never would have committed to something like this back at the beginning, um, they genuinely believe it's better to, to go forward than to, uh, to drop out. Um, another possible contingency is uh, uh, some of the owners, some of the uh, um, UAMPS owners will choose to drop out. Uh, municipals have defaulted uh, in situations like that in the past, leaving the others with a choice of whether to increase 
their ceiling to pick up the difference. And then finally, there's the problem that occurs with first-of-a-kind plants like this one, where it doesn't operate up to expectations in the early years. I don't know what uh, projections for what's called a capacity factor uh, UAMPS is using in arriving at their cost estimates. What I've seen happen in other situations is that the would-be builder takes the industry uh, average for nuclear plants, which is above 90 percent, pretty good. But it's not a good number for a first-of-a-kind plant in its early years. Uh, there's uh, one plant that's in its startup phase is now in Tennessee that's capacity factors at 56 percent. Um, the uh, gas-cooled reactor at Fort St. Brain in Colorado, um, built back in the 1980s, never attained a capacity factor above 30 percent. You know, when you start seeing numbers like that, it has the effect of doubling and tripling the costs per kilowatt hour because the capital costs of these plants are so high that if they only produce a third of the kilowatt hours you expected, you have to charge three times more um, to get them. Uh, Fermi-1 was another first-of-a-kind reactor in uh, Michigan. They had a very serious accident not far from Detroit, operated for only a couple of years, and closed down for good after five years of operation, again, uh, leaving the long-term fixed costs with the builders. Um, okay, so what can one do about this? Well, one answer, of course, is don't go there, but let's uh, – Let's try to talk also within the framework of the um, proposal. Uh, the first thing that uh, experience in other parts of the countries would suggest is the wisdom of using all source requests for proposals, all, all source bidding, uh, in which essentially the utility says, we're going to need this much power for this many years. We welcome all proposals and combinations of proposals to see who can provide it for how much money. And by the way, who is prepared to make firm commitments uh, as distinguished from uh, predictions and, uh, and promises. Um, and that's where you're seeing these really low uh, uh, responses, especially in the solar field in Colorado, in Arizona, Texas, um, in the last year or so. Uh, and furthermore, once you've done that, you then have a real market basis for setting a cap. Instead of setting it at 6.5 cents a kilowatt hour, say to uh, New Scale, Department of Energy, UAMPS, okay, now we know how much power really costs, uh, we'll adjust it in whatever way we think we should for the low carbon qualities, the diversity qualities, uh, the reliability qualities. But that's the cap that we want to see in the contract, not your 6.5 uh, cents a kilowatt hour. And, and my guess is that the number would be, uh, would be significantly lower. Um, then uh, with regard to the cap, if you're going to make it enforceable, you've got to know who's going to step up and pay the difference if the, its big cost overruns occur. And you have to be able to enforce that. So if it's supposed to be new scale, and you ask, well, what happens if new scale goes bankrupt, because we've seen that movie before, the answer is they have to bond it somehow. Um, they, they have to make sure adequate revenues are set aside. They may not be able to bond it, but that would be important information to have, too, that uh, the bonding companies thought the risks were too large, so why should the ratepayers in small towns in Utah take them? Um, and then finally, just be aware of the full history of nuclear history and the uncertainties that uh, it entails um, in order to uh, frame your sense of the decision-making risks going forward. I'll stop there in, in order to be sure and leave time for questions. So if there, if there are no questions, we can play around further with at the this slides.
So at this point, if anyone is interested in asking a question, please raise your hand and I will bring you the microphone. Thank you for that excellent presentation. Thanks. Uh, I do have a, I have a couple of questions. Uh, there are some are related. <laughs> uh, historically, one of the reasons that nuclear has been able to maintain costs relatively low is due to the long operating, uh, the long time period that nuclear plants can operate. So my first question is, um, what estimates for costs were being used and over what time spans are they anticipating new power plants to be operating? And my second, which is kind of related is, um, given that in the European Union, we see multiple nations such as France and Sweden implementing nuclear power on a wide scale with costs significantly less than adjacent neighboring countries which invest heavily in renewables such as Germany, what do you think is the difference in the cost discrepancy we're seeing between the European Union and the United States? Uh, let's see. Um, first of all, the, as I understand it, the projected, the contract life related to UAMS is 40 years. Uh, the existing reactors, most of them have extended their lives to 60 years. Um, the 6.5 cent a kilowatt hour cap should have mentioned earlier, uh, is in 2017 dollars. So it's not, a, it, it will escalate with, uh, with inflation over that time. It's not 6.7 cents uh, for those 40 years. Um, uh, it's hard to know whether that's, uh, how good a deal that is. The argument was made in the last round of nuclear power plant construction Yes, these things cost a lot to build, but once you have them, they operate for a long time at a high capacity factor. And so they provide really substantial economic benefits toward the end of their lives. Um, and I must say, I, that made sense to me. I, I believed it when I was regulating back in the 70s and 80s. But what's really happening now is actually the opposite. Uh, in the regions with power markets and operating nuclear plants, one after another, these plants are coming in and saying, we can't meet the prices in these markets, especially driven by natural gas, but also renewables and the demand fall off. And the fact that as the plants get older, their operating costs tend to creep up a little. And they're saying, we either are going to close, seven or eight of them have, or we're going to have to get a subsidy from the customers, uh, rate increases basically, so that you pay us more than the market price to keep us in operation. And New York, Illinois, maybe New Jersey have accepted, as to some of their nuclear plants, for at least a few years, the need to give those, those subsidies. That seems to stand the argument about long-term benefit on its head. I mean, if you paid in the early years, so that you would get cheap power in the late years, but now you're having to pay above market power, above market prices in the late years, too. Uh, so the history of the last generation, anyway, doesn't really affirm the idea that, that nuclear units are a long-term economic benefit. Few things are more humbling than trying to forecast power prices. It could be that 40 years from now, gas prices will have turned around. I, I don't know what could go wrong with the solar and wind and efficiency industries, but maybe for some reason market prices will be back up and the nuclear plants will look good again. But right now, that, uh, that argument is not, uh, not so persuasive. As to what's going on in Europe, it's a mixed story. Um, the two plants that have uh, been under construction for a while in Western Europe, Flamanville in France, and I never pronounce it right, but Ultrajoto in Finland, uh, are both um, double their uh, number, double the number of years it was supposed to take to build them. Again, two advanced reactor uh, designs, and billions of dollars over budget. So, no one in 
Western Europe anyway now, is building any new uh, plants. The French, um, I haven't looked at their prices versus Germany's versus Sweden's lately, but I'm not sure it's correct that there's a big difference between uh, German French and Swedish prices. And it's confusing anyway because the Germans export a good deal of power, uh, albeit coal power, to, uh, to other European countries. Germany does use less nuclear power, certainly, than either France or Sweden. It does use some, um, although it's committed to, uh, to phasing it out. Um, and I guess I'm, I'm taking a very long way of saying I really don't know the answer to your question because I'm not sure what the difference between the power prices these days between those, those countries are. The French nuclear plants are all old plants. Uh, or at least 20 years old. They were built under a regime that heavily standardized them. One reactor builder, one design, two different sizes, a national licensor, whereas the US system had four builders, 50 state regulators, uh, and uh, no real effort at uh, standardization. So the French, costs have tended to be lower. On the other hand, they have never included some of the costs that we always include in ours, such as waste disposal and decommissioning of the plants. And in fact, I've forgotten the name of their government accounting office, but it's recently kind of blown the whistle on Electricité de France and said you've got billions of dollars in unfunded liabilities that you're going to have to start charging for before much longer. Um, Sweden, I just don't, I, I don't know the Swedish story well enough to, to comment sensibly at all. Yeah. Thank you for your presentation. One of the, the novelties of the new scale design is it's, it's, it's an answer to, in a sense, the Fukushima disaster. It's a, it has the capability to shut itself down without power. Uh, indefinitely and not have a meltdown. And uh, I'd, I've looked into their design a lot and I tend to agree with that. I'd, I'm curious as a, as a previous NRC commissioner if you have any thoughts on that. And then also a thought, uh, it's, it's, this is a big uh, point in innovation for our country. And, and I do agree it's irrational to think that a first of a kind will necessarily meet its cost. But then on the other hand, to to say that it's destined to fail and try to cut it short before it gets a chance to gain legs is, is also maybe not the, the best decision for our, our country too. So just a comment there, but uh, your, your, your thoughts on the, the safety of the design. Okay, uh, let me start with the last point just that's fresh in my mind and, and just to say fair enough that uh, there, I'm not standing here telling you it's going to fail. Uh, I, I am standing here telling you, though, that the, I have heard those same hopes, promises, expectations stated in, in a lot of different forums, uh, and not so many of them have turned out uh, have turned out well. Um, so the people in charge of power supply procurement in, in Utah, who's after all, it, it's their decision. Um, uh, I wouldn't advise them to go sailing into it on the basis that the changes that have been made in this design have resolved all of the problems uh, from the, the past designs. Because that really was the premise of the nuclear renaissance 12, 15 years ago. You know, we hadn't built a new reactor in the US in 20, 25 years. Westinghouse, General Electric, uh, Framatome, as it then was, um, we're all knocking on the door saying we've learned our lesson, we've learned our lesson, we've, we've got it right now. Um, and 29 of those 31 plants are gone, and even the last two are, are really expensive. So be careful. Is, is, uh, don't, uh, don't go cruising in as though this was a, a slam dunk. There, you know, 
I'm a lawyer by background, so my safety judgments take them for what they're worth. I, I agree with you that there are some attractive safety features about uh, the SMR. Um, uh, if nothing else, obviously, it, it, uh, the radioactive inventory is a lot smaller. My one concern there is that there's some tendency on the part of the builders to take credit for the safety in cost reductions. Um, so uh, I'll just put this hypothetically because I'm not qualified to, to, to get much more specific about it, but to say because there is less heat, uh, lower pressures, less radiation, we can reduce the thickness of the shielding or, or reduce the off-site emergency planning zones. It seems as though you can get more safety or you can get cheaper costs, but and maybe you can get a mixture of each, but you can't fully take credit for both. If you take credit for all the safety improvements by reducing safety margins, then at the end of that day, your safety margin will be the same. You may have a cheaper plan. Sure. Oh, sorry. In, in some of the past debacles, can you describe what the federal government did? And the reason I'm asking is that and, I, and I'm a little confused what New Scale is doing and what UAMS is doing because I don't, I'm a little confused about it. But um, in Idaho, there's, well, there's, I'm from Idaho, and, and in Idaho, they are saying that the federal government will be picking up half the tab of the $4.3 so at some point, um, you know, and I expect it, I expect that to happen. So does that just change a lot of your numbers? It could. I mean, it, it certainly could for Utah. It, remember, I said that one possibility was that if the 6.5 cent cap were exceeded and you had a contract in which the federal government was ironclad tying in, tied into absorbing, extra costs, then at least you could treat the 6.5 cents or whatever the cap was as being a real hard cap as distinguished from what I think you have now. Um, uh, you know, the fe I mean, the federal history on nuclear energy is a fascinating but also endless subject. It's the only industry that was born entirely in government laboratories, the Manhattan Project. Uh, so when you get into arguments about what industry is subsidized, what isn't, uh, uh, nuclear really uh, has had substantial federal sponsorship. Um, uh, the Atomic Energy Commission had all kinds of different grants to uh, encourage uh, um, industry startups. Uh, and the Department of Energy has played various roles. TVA has played various roles. Bonneville has played various roles uh, as reactor builders, co-owners, supporters. Um, uh, I think one, uh, I don't have a problem with a federal role in nuclear energy research. I wish I had some sense that it was the result of a <coughs> rational prioritization process uh, in which it the benefits and costs were compared to other uh, uh, sources, but uh, you know, f I, for example, when the Congress was considering uh, energy legislation that led to some nuclear subsidies 15 years ago, and then on into the Waxman-Markey debates, there were proposals to specifically pay for, I think, seven demonstration projects in order to see how the different reactor types would work and, and how they would operate. Um, I didn't feel that was necessarily a bad deal if it included uh, meaningful carbon legislation. My own conjecture was that it would prove that nuclear wasn't economic, but I was perfectly willing that 
make common cause with those who thought it would show the opposite uh, in order to get a meaningful package done. And then we'd have seven reactors, and we'd I'm afraid we'd know exactly what we're learning at Total now. But uh, um, so there, I mean, there are there is a role there for the federal government, but this sort of mindless and under the table subsidizing doesn't doesn't strike me as a good thing. So I think you had a question. So that is all the time we have for today's forum. Please join me in thanking our guests for an interesting and informative forum.